Tonight, Samsung's claiming it's developed four-plus gigabit Wi-Fi, Apple's 50 million penalty for leaking product information, and a website admits that Snapchat photos were hacked from their server. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 192 for Monday, October 13th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to over 50 job boards with just one click. Try ZipRecruiter for a free four-day trial right now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TN and the number two. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. According to Microsoft, there is a lot of interest in Windows 10. The company's Windows Insider program hit 1 million registrants over the weekend. Now, joining the Windows Insider program doesn't necessarily mean that a user will install a preview, but currently, it's the only way to try out Windows 10, so the numbers definitely matter. Microsoft also said it's received over 200,000 pieces of feedback through the Windows native feedback application and has gotten some interesting t statistics rather out of that, too. Half of all installs are are running on virtual machines, for example, meaning that most of its users have installed Windows 10 natively, and most users are using seven or more apps per day. The team promises to continue to revise and improve the OS before its official launch. Samsung's making a pretty big claim. The company says that it has developed 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi technology that closes the current gap between theoretical and actual Wi-Fi speeds. Now, Samsung says that the technology is capable of data speeds of up to 4.6 gigabits per second. That's like 575 megabytes per second, which is about five times faster than the current ceiling for Wi-Fi speeds for consumer electronics devices, which is about 866 megabits per second or 108 megabytes per second. So that's a huge increase. How did Samsung do this? The company says that it solved the speed killing issues that surround millimeter waves, which travel by line of sight, and that's why things like cement walls and other obstacles end up being an issue for connection speeds. Instead, Samsung's using wide coverage beam forming antenna, that's their term, not mine, and micro beam forming control technology, and the company expects commercialization of this unlicensed 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi band spectrum as early as next year. Excited for a MacBook Air with Retina display at Apple's event this Thursday? Don't hold your breath, reports Recode, citing sources familiar with Apple's plans. Recode, which has a pretty good track record about this stuff as of late, says that while a Retina MacBook Air may in fact be in the works, it's not going to be shown off at Thursday's event. That event will only focus on new iPads, a new high-res iMac, and OS X Yosemite. So, on to the iPad specifically. Component photo leaks uh, that leaked over the weekend show an A8X chip, which is similar to the AA chip that's in the uh, iPhone 6, but probably overclocked, and Touch ID button technology may be making their way to the new iPads. Both of those rumors are not too surprising. And more photos published by blog apple.club.tw shows what looks like two gigabytes of RAM for app memory, which would double what's in the current gen iPad Air and make for more powerful, all sorts of stuff, multitasking. The iPad update is also expected to include Touch ID for use with Apple Pay and possibly an improved display for outdoor viewing, which would be awesome, and maybe even a gold option. At this point, I really need a gold iPad or I'm going to be pretty bummed. Before it filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy last week, Sapphire supplier GT Advanced Technologies had made a $578 million deal with Apple, that was last year, to step up manufacturing of the scratch-resistant material used on the iPhone to protect uh, not only Touch ID, the fingerprint sensor, but also the rear camera lens with Sapphire because it's nice and it's, it's very strong. And on two of three Apple Watch models that are due out next year, all going to have Sapphire. So it's very unfortunate that things have gone the way that they've gone for GT as far as Apple's concerned. However, court filings made by GT have not only revealed that Apple imposes a whopping 
$50 million penalty per occurrence for leaking any information about an upcoming unannounced Apple product. But GT has also argued in court, this was last week, that even more information about its relationship with Apple should be published. The company has hinted that the terms of Apple's contract were unreasonable, uh, has referred to them as oppressive and burdensome. GT has also asked for permission to disclose the details of its agreement in the interest of creditors and equity holders and other stakeholders, as well as to ensure an open open, transparent, and fair process. It sounds ugly so far. Cloud storage continues to not really be rock solid as a storage option. Yep, are you getting that feeling yet? Dropbox has confirmed the bug in some older versions of its desktop apps ended up deleting files of some of its customers who turned on Selective Sync, which limits cloud syncing to certain folders. Now, this could happen after a crash or a forced reboot, but at least a few users said... Uh, reported that they lost years worth of content, you know, in some cases, photos or, or things that had not been backed up in other places, which is, I don't know about you, that's my worst nightmare. Dropbox says that it is restoring files where it can, and it's released fixed versions of its apps. It's preventing older apps from working and then putting more safeguards in place to prevent something like this from happening again. Affected users are also receiving emails that offer a year's worth of Dropbox Pro. Uh, the service is basically a consolation prize. Coming up, a smartwatch that uses skin buttons projected onto your arm. Yep. And up next, I'll talk with Elise Hu from NPR about how Snapchat photos may be not so secure and are getting hacked from a server. It's not good. But first, are you hiring? I know you are. You were telling me that you're, you're scaling your business, which is great. I'm very happy for you. But do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates because the best candidates, you know, they don't just necessarily walk in and you gotta, gotta, gotta post your job to the right place. ZipRecruiter not only lets you, lets you post your job to over 50 job boards, which gives you a lot, lot, uh, a lot more uh, visibility, but they also maintain a really well-stocked resume database. So you can, you can do some searching as well. You can search from over 4 million resumes, 4 million, with thousands of new ones that are added every day of qualified people that might need to be working for your company. You don't even have to search every day. In fact, ZipRecruiter can send you resume alerts when a new candidate shows up that matches your search. You can find candidates based on city or industry nationwide. You basically just need to post once and then ZipRecruiter does the organization for you. Their interface will show you qualified candidates that just kind of roll in. Once you have the right people, right candidates, ZipRecruiter makes it easy to review them. And you can find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 250,000 businesses. You know why? Because it works. Right now, our viewers and listeners of TN2 can try out ZipRecruiter for a free four-day trial. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. And thanks to ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Tonight. And I hope you hire soon and hire well. Elise Hu joins us now, reporter, uh, tech and culture reporter over at NPR. Hello, Elise. Hi there, Sarah. Good to be with you again. Good, good to have you here. So, all right, I mentioned right before the break that Snapchat photos, not just one or two, but this is a, a story from late last week that... Um, up to about 200,000 photos from Snapchat were hacked and posted online. What's interesting about this is that Snapchat says, this is no fault of our own. This is a third party app that's not even legal where these images were being stored. And that website, which is called snapsaved.com, is the one that was hacked. So how does this work? Does Snapchat not have control over their own API? So Snapchat is blaming essentially users, right, for getting their things stolen because they're constantly saying don't use third-party apps because their site architecture and their API isn't that secure. And it, they've taken some steps to make it more secure, but they're saying essentially you shouldn't have used Snap Saved in the first place. Snap Saved, for those of you who don't use it, allow for users to do things that Snapchat, the actual app, don't let you do. For instance, use um, Snapchat on a desktop rather than a mobile device. And more importantly, it sort of undermines, Snap Saved actually undermines Snapchat's whole ephemerality um, promise by letting you actually save photos. Now, what happens if you can save photos um, means that they could potentially, that database, or in setting up um, Snap Saved, the administrators could screw up and um, allow for a hack to happen or a leak to happen. And so 
that's essentially what Snap Saved is saying happened, that they made a mistake as they were setting some servers up and um, there was a leak. Now, they are claiming that this leak isn't as big as um, what has been reported. Uh, and then this story has another confusing layer because there's also hackers um, in places where they claim their conquests, like 4chan, um, hackers who are actually saying, no, a site administrator from SnapSaved actually gave us info to get into uh, this trove of data. So um, what actually happened is still a little bit unclear uh, and getting pieced together right now. But obviously, Sarah, as we talked about before the show, the big question, of course, is, you know, where where are we safe online? And is anything that we think is ephemeral really ephemeral? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of third-party apps that are um, using, you know, in some cases an unofficial API has been an issue for some time. Every once in a while, well, this hasn't happened in, in some time for me, but, you know, something from my Twitter account posts something because I had hooked up my Twitter account to this third-party uh, service at some point years ago and kind of forgot about it, and then my information was out there. When you're talking about photos and or videos that might be shared that are, they're really uh, meant to be seen for, you know, five seconds or less and then never seen again, that really adds a whole another layer of complexity to the security problem. And I think one of the questions is, OK, well, you've got Snapchat that s seems like it's really dropping the ball, not having an API without loopholes. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if anyone's going to use Snapchat, they should really feel like the, the the service is pretty rock solid. So you've got something like SnapSaved. Maybe it's somebody that worked at SnapSaved. Maybe SnapSave was just extremely uh, insecure. It almost doesn't matter. The point is, is that this stuff got out. So, you know, how many services have to get hacked in order for anything to change? Or are we just entering some sort of an era where younger people are used to this? Yeah, so the question is, how much does privacy really matter to 15-year-olds and the people, people younger than that? So Generation Z, if you will. Because, you know, I was talking with um, Harper Reed, who is a technologist and an entrepreneur and former chief technology officer for Obama. And he said, you know what, we're thinking about privacy all wrong because I would posit that privacy isn't that big of a concern for the people who are going to really be stewards of the web, the next generation. So maybe the conversation is all wrong because we're coming at it from our 30-year-old point of view. Um, and so that sort of rocked my whole notion of what we're even talking about here. But but it, it is a legitimate question because this keeps happening, and yet you know it seems like we're getting almost numb to it. Yeah, I, I guess... Yeah. So what what really happens at this point? Because as you as you mentioned, you and I chatted a little bit about this issue before the show. And it's like, well, we're going to get to a point where a company will either be able to make that we're secure claim or they will show that they can't make that claim. Because right now, all companies make that claim. And so then when, so, when something like uh, a, a collection of Snapchat photos in possibly the hundreds of thousands uh, get posted online, you realize a company can say whatever they want. And it, it, it always seems to be that they will get hacked eventually. Yeah, and my question is obviously going to be what is the fallout of this quote unquote snapping or whatever they're calling it? Yeah, um, there's snapping. lots of Snapgate, the various hashtags for it. <laughs> What's going to be the fallout on um, on business for Snapchat? Are are they actually going to lose users? And so, if that were to happen, then it would up their prerogative to sort of increase security and get more serious about um, its API. But if there is actually just kind of a marginal or a negligible loss in, in usage, um, then I think that sort of tells you all you need to know about this question of privacy and how much really young users care about it. I also have to wonder, who wants to use Snapchat as a desktop app? That just seems very <laughs> counterintuitive to the, 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 the way that we're going in the world. I don't know. Uh, it, you know. It just kind of sticks out to me as like, I don't want to use that either. Yeah, uh, Snapchat saved is against the future. I, I have no idea. That's a really good question. Uh, well, we will we will ponder this uh, before we meet again next Thursday. I'm actually going to be uh, filling in for uh, for Mike Elgin on TNT, and Elise is going to be my co-host for the day. So who knows? Maybe we'll have a lot more to talk about between now and then. Elise, who reports uh, on tech and culture at NPR and is a frequent guest here on Twit. Thanks so much, Elise, for being with us. Thanks, Sarah. Great to be here. And before you go, just let folks know uh, where they can keep up with your work. That's right. I blog at All Tech Considered on NPR.org. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Elise WHO. Excellent. We'll see you soon. Thank you. See you later.
All right, finally, uh, we mentioned some kind of interesting wrist technology that applies to wearables. So wearable technology is making its way onto wrists slowly, but surely all companies are going to have their own version of some sort of smartwatch. Carnegie Mellon's Future Interfaces Group has developed something pretty interesting. It's kind of like the potential solution to the issue of tiny watch buttons. You got a small watch, you got fat fingers, well, you know, you got to got to use buttons. So Carnegie Mellon developed something it calls skin buttons. So they use little lasers, tiny little laser projectors to make controls appear directly on your skin rather than the watch face itself. It's a prototype and it uh, consists of four micro lasers that emit very simple icon shapes like a home button or a, a play or a pause control, something that we're used to, a push notification for email maybe, up and down arrows to scroll. Infrared sensors will watch for when your finger taps one of those buttons and then it turns your skin into a touchscreen display. Pretty amazing. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. It's amazing if, you know, we ever get to buy it. But for now, it looks pretty cool. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. And you can write us at TN2 at twit.tv with feedback. Don't miss Tech News today. That is tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I will see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Eastern for another edition of Tech News Tonight. Yeah, that's right. I'm Sarah Lane. Th that I know. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.